this is a bit of a journey for all of the startups um, that are here. So what I'd like to do to start with is to acknowledge the support of Microsoft. Um, thank you very much for the auditorium. Um, thank you also for having the event less than a mile from my first public company, Iridex, which is just on the other side of the overpass at 101, and it's still there 20 years later. Very proud of that. Um, but most important, um, Louis, can you grab Amanda before she leaves the room? Yeah, great. Amanda, you impressed the hell out of me. You are phenomenal. You made this event work. No one thought it would really work. You made it work. It's all down to you. Thank you. Yeah. And Louis, you had to put up with the Red Sock comments yesterday, so here's to you too, mate. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Jess Kelso, Nerida Bronley, Sophia Ridden, Ridwan, Anna Groot, and Nina. Nina, thank you so much for chairing the mentor committee and, and the steering committee. I can't imagine how you managed to control those 30 type A people who all had advice on how we should do this. So Nina, thank you, and thanks also to the mentors. So, to the entrepreneurs, yesterday we talked about the start of your entrepreneurial journey. What you do next is really going to define who you are. So, first question, who's erased failure from their vocabulary? Thank you. So we've succeeded in my first wish, which was to erase failure. You know, any time you try and do something extraordinary, something that's really worth doing, something that really matters, the probability of failure can be overwhelming. You should never let that stop you from trying. Because there is no failure. Once you take the leap to entrepreneurship, you succeed. You succeed at first on a personal level. It fundamentally changes who you are. But if you're really successful, it changes the world in some way. When you run into a setback, it's how you react to that setback that determines whether it's a failure, a word that doesn't exist, or whether it's in fact an opportunity to reposition and make that crisis event the catalyst for something truly extraordinary. As entrepreneurs, we call that plan B or plan C, or VCs like to call it pivoting, um, or some entrepreneurs like Mike call it the oh shit moment. Entrepreneurs, fundamentally, are like water. Not just in that they sustain life and growth, but more importantly, water is unbeatable. Water can overcome any obstacle. It wears away the hardest resistance and it never gives up. The other great thing about water is it can give you a plan B, and it can give you a plan C. And that's my last trick. <laughs> Many of you will succeed on plan B or plan C. Google succeeded on plan F, and they did pretty well. So nothing wrong with plan F. But the thing to realize is, is it's how you react to those crises and how you develop plan B, plan C, and to never give up. Be like water, punch your way through the rock, grind away at it until it works. So that's my first wish, that you don't give up. My second wish is that if you succeed on plan A, be humble about it. Mike is a great example of how a successful CEO of a startup should behave. Don't follow the arrogant path, right? Success is as much about luck as it is about good planning. Now, if you look around the valley, you'll find many, many great examples of CEOs. Last year, we had Craig Barrett and John Bale. Um, Craig was the CEO of uh, public company, Atheros. They're great examples, too, of how CEOs should behave. So be humble, because success is a gift. When you get given a gift, it's important to pass it on. So my second wish is that those of you who do succeed, whether it's on plan A or plan G, be humble and give back. This valley was built on paying it forward, on the principle of giving it back. And if the valley doesn't teach you anything else, it will teach you to be humble. So that's my second wish, <clears throat> that you learn that humility and that you share the wealth of success with your peers. Mentor people, help your other fellow CEOs reach the success that you did. And I wanted to also add that 
many people come here gauging success by money. And money is a great metric for accountants and lawyers to gauge success. It's not a great metric for entrepreneurs. In the Valley, for sure, if your measure of success is money, you're going to be very, very disappointed because there will always be someone with much more than you. Personally, I always like to gauge success by how much money I put in the pockets of my team. When we took our first company public and the line level engineers and office people became millionaires, that was far more satisfying than anything else. Seeing the happiness and the life changing event that that success um, and the reward for all of the loyalty and service for all those years working together, that is much more valuable and it's a much more powerful motivator. Money is not a good motivator for startups. Passion is what fuels startups, it's what VCs invest in, the passion and the drive. If you're just driven by money, chances are you're going to give up when you hit the first major roadblock. The other thing I wanted to say, um, yesterday when I was listening to the um, current generation of entrepreneurs share their experiences in the valley, I was a little concerned um, about this image of Silicon Valley having streets paved with gold and the ease with which you can come here and raise money and you should just leave Australia and come here and stay here and never go back. That's not what this summit is about. That's not the message we're trying to get across. So my second wish is that you immerse yourself in the valley, you take the learnings from Silicon Valley, but you take that knowledge back and you try to influence change in Australia. Because for all of its great features, the valley has one major impediment. It's a red ocean of competition. There are thousands and thousands of other people here who have similar ideas to you, who either grew up here or who studied here, who are likely to be better prepared and better positioned to raise money than you are. So great to come here, great to learn, but it is fiercely, fiercely competitive. So my second wish is that you take the knowledge you learn here and you go back to Australia and you swim in a blue ocean and you create change because then your success, like the success of a company like Atlassian, you'll grow a tall tree that will drop acorns that will grow other companies around it, other startups around it, and you'll start an ecosystem exactly the way it was started here in Silicon Valley 30 years ago. So that's my second wish. My third wish is that you give Mike a warm round of applause. Thank him for coming. <laughs> Mike, do you want the blue pill or the red pill? I'm not sure how to follow that. Acorns, Swim in the blue ocean. Trees, water, Swim magic in the blue ocean. Now, you did sit in the wrong chair, didn't you? Did I? That's all right. No, oh, actually, yeah, we better swap. Okay. All right, for my next trick. So, everyone knows who Mike is. No need for introductions? No? He has a small startup in Sydney. So, Mike, what I'd like to do today is kind of walk through your entrepreneurial journey pretty much from when you left college. Um, I'll try to do it differently to the way it's been done before. Hopefully we'll succeed. So I'd like to sort of start at the beginning, if I can find the clicker. Um, you and Scott basically came straight out of uni. Um, you worked a little bit, but then you basically started a company. Don't look at the slides, mate, there. I'll distract you. <laughs> <laughs> it's relatively young looking. So what were your other options at the time? Uh, well, it sounds funny now, but we um, we had really, like, uh, so Scott and I had, um, in a winter scholarship course, it was like 30, 35 of us, and pretty much the two major employers were PwC and IBM, and we didn't really want to work for either of them, and within six months of leaving university, they became the same company anyway, so we had like 25 classmates all went to the same place, um, so that was really our kind of biggest other option, and we, we really didn't want to do that. We spent six months working at IBM as a trainee, and after six months of installing Windows, I was done. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was super interesting work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was our, our initial goal was to convince ourselves we weren't crazy by making a grad salary, which was at the time 44,000 US dollars. That was our run rate goal at the end of year one. <laughs> That's pretty ambitious. <laughs> okay, so um, you got sick of installing Windows, so then you. Um started installing hardware. We did. Wow, geez, where'd you get all these uh, classic oh, photos? I'll never tell. Um, so this is, is your that a beer in my back pocket? <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> awesome. 
quality photo. So this is setting up your first actual office, but I think you worked out of your bedroom for a while too, right? Uh, we did, we did, we did. We worked out of our, uh, our bedrooms at home for a little while, and then um, we actually, uh, Nikki Shivak from Startmate, well, Nikki and I started a company before Alassian, and we sold that, and then uh, I stole three desks at the back of the company he was working at. Um, no, 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 one, no one mentioned that, okay. Yeah, we borrowed them, and uh, eventually we had more staff than they did, so they kicked us out. <laughs> so we had to get this place. So. <laughs> it, it happens. Now, um, mate, building a startup in Australia is not easy. And you guys, a lot of people forget, you, you started 10 years ago. So Lassian was a sort of a 10-year overnight success, mm -hmm. like, like mm -hmm. many startups. 11 now, technically. 11 years, yeah. So, so why did you do that? Why did you stay in Australia? Um... Different now, but back then th there was no option really. I mean, 2002 when we started was like nuclear winter for tech, so we didn't even attempt to raise money. That's the funniest thing that everyone nowadays is straight out. I've got a good idea, I'm gonna go raise some money. It's like, why is that your first step? We we had no, we had no chance of raising money. There was no VC industry in Australia at all. Um, we had no chance of actually getting over here. Dot com crash had happened, so even over here it was pretty much nuclear winter. So we you know, we just kind of stuck it out in Australia. We didn't try to raise capital, but it meant that we had to, you know, it took us a lot longer, the sort of slow burn to get going, um, but it put us in a much more solid state. Right. And uh, your dad made me promise to show this picture. <laughs> um, so, you know, your dad says he wrote the first check, but, but I think part of it was him and part of it was credit cards, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's always been frustrated that uh, we didn't let him invest, actually. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think he wrote the checks for my education, um, <laughs> which certainly came in handy. But no, the first two was just, uh, yeah, our credit cards and we had some a uh, little bit of personal funds. It was probably, I don't know, 10 grand. We've never actually added up. It's always written up in the media as 10 grand. I don't know why they picked that round number at some point. But uh, look, we bought two, in those days, we bought two desktop PCs um, with big, huge monitors on them. That was the initial outlay for the business. Wasn't wasn't glamorous. So so ten grand on credit cards. So mate, um, was Visa better than VC? Uh, I think it was. Yeah, the the, the <laughs> payback's a lot less. <laughs> um, so mate, you're a first time CEO. In fact, is that is that the blue screen of death you're experiencing there? Uh, no, that's no. that's in Belgium. Belgium, I think, okay. Actually, so so Mike, you're a first time CEO. T tell us about your biggest mistake. Um, there's a lot of them. Uh, like a failure is a word we should erase. I'm like, Jesus. exactly. Yeah. I hit that every day. Um, <laughs> uh, probably not understanding people enough and how important they are. Uh, we've been very big on culture and those sorts of things, but um, actually, that's not true. It's probably uh, learning to fire people quickly enough. Actually, if I had to have one big mistake, the only times we've made huge egregious errors is where we've let someone. Uh, who was a good person in the wrong job, uh, stay around for too long just because we were gutless. Is it because you're gutless or because you felt an obligation to try and nurture them and teach them and make them better? Uh, yeah, a little from column A, a little from column B. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very hard conversation to have with someone to say that it's not working out. Um, and we've had to do it a lot now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, your initial time, you definitely think, oh, if I work a little harder or put them in a different job or do this or do that, and, and sometimes they just need a different environment altogether. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, I think we, we've we certainly learned that lesson a lot, a lot of times. How do you notice the team react when you finally do get rid of the person or move them? Uh, I reckon there's two reactions. The fir first reaction is um, people like, thank Christ, why didn't you do that sooner? And then you're like, oh, shit, everyone else noticed but me. That was a bad sign. Um, the second reaction is uh, you get from teams, which is usually from their, their subordinates, and usually I found this is where you have a manager um, or a team lead or something that is a great guy. Everybody loves him. He's like what I call the suburban soccer coach. So he's like the dad soccer coach. Everyone loves the coach. He's great. He may not be actually any good at teaching you soccer, but he seems like a really good bloke. So everyone gets on well with him, et cetera. And then you let him go and the whole team's at your door going, hey, what happened? We, we really liked, you know, Bob. Why'd you get rid of Bob? And inevitably, six months later, that same team comes and goes, I understand why you got rid of Bob. Now that we've got Jim, Jim is like miles better. He's taught me so much about my job. You know, I'm, I'm performing at twice the level I was beforehand. Um, and so those, those are the satisfying ones where they actually come back and say, no, I get it now. Um, but they're certainly pissed off on day one. 
what, what often happened to me as a CEO is I, I carried my founding team who became the executive team for way too long. And before I knew it, you ended up with two layers of management mm -hmm. because you, the loyalty that your founding team had, you, didn't, you wanted to pay that back. But yeah. at the same time, you needed b better managers. Yeah, Ma management sounds teams like are really hard. That. I mean, we we um, we always say this. We, it's, it's, it sort of sounds bad, but we're on, and I mean it in the most positive way. We're sort of a management team 3.0 uh, in our business, which is um, a really hard thing because I don't. Um, the people on 2.0 are great people, and a lot of them have gone on to other Australian startups to do to do great things at those different positions. One of the hard things about sort of growth companies is people have. Um, uh, scale limits of their experience. So you may be really good at running, um, you know, a, a, a certain type of team, call it an engineering team, whatever, from, uh, you know, from 20 engineers or 10 engineers, which you're used to, up to, to 50 people, you know, and you just nail that part of the journey. And then the, the trip from 500 engineers to five, to 50 engineers to 500 engineers is you totally out of your depth. Um, and, you know, we've sort of, had a lot of those management steps where people have done a great job for a couple of years and then the company has just out, outpaced them um, and they've gone back to do almost the same job again but with more skills, more mastery of the 10 to 50 journey of engineers at another company and gone and nailed it much better than they would have done um, staying with us. So, um, you know, we always celebrate, we, we pretty much get back all of those people for company events and everything. They're all a part of the journey. It's just uh, growth companies are hard like that. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point because m many companies um, kind of cut people off when they leave, literally escort them from the building yeah. and never have them back. And, and you're quite different in that. Yeah, we, we always, um, I mean, they're, 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 they're part of the journey. I mean, they came along on the, the, the trip at some point. They, they worked their asses off like everybody else. Um, and so we try to, to celebrate them and we hope a lot of them come back at different times. We've actually had, we have had instances now of people who've left and, and actually come back. We've been around long enough to have that, which is really nice. Um, and, you know, they still send us referrals. You know, you want everyone to leave on a positive note. It's not always possible, but we're, you know, we're, uh, as much as possible, you try to make that, you know, happen. So, so um, uh, I won't say how long ago, but um, when I told my boss I was leaving to start a, um, my own company, um, he sort of smiled, shook my hand, escorted me from the building, and then filed a lawsuit against me about a month later. Um, <laughs> I'm, imagining you don't, I'm imagining that's not what you do. No, this was East Coast. Uh, not really, no. I mean, we, we, we're very open. We try to be, you know, um, you know sort of values-driven company. IP is difficult. We, we do have issues with IP and, you know, people leaving and then saying, hey, I'm going to rebuild that myself. And it's like, buddy, that's not, not so cool. Um, it's it's a very complicated area with with IP. I mean, I know for in terms of you know harder manufacturing and chips and things like that, it's it's a much 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 more core issue than even uh, even for us. But um, you know, we try to be as understanding as possible. And if people are working on stuff, you know, if you're writing a fiction novel in your spare time, I, d I don't care, right? If you're um, writing your own issue tracker on your spare time, I'm kind of like, dude, that's not not so not so okay. So, and yet you uh, you actually encourage your team. Your, your, your whole team basically to take a day, a month at least, or more to go work on something different, right? Charity or... Uh, yeah, yeah. So our staff get five, five days a year. It's not quite a day a month, but they get five days a year to, to work on non-profit ventures. Um, we certainly encourage it. I wish a lot more of them took it, to be honest. Um, it's, it's an allowance that, uh, that we, we're trying to actually drive up the, uh, the, the uptake of it, but it's, uh, it's good, gets them to do something totally different. And uh, people have a very different perspective if they go and, it, it really doesn't matter what you go and do for a day, um, uh, whether you're helping you know, stray animals or working in a soup kitchen or building a house, you, know, you kind of come back with a very different perspective on how lucky you are. For sure. So Mike, what is the most important thing about being a CEO? How many photos do you have? A lot. Um, <laughs> 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 what, what makes a great CEO? Uh, um, I think the good ones have an ability, oh, I'm not actually in that photo, so that's all right. Um, I think the good ones have an ability to never stop learning. They always, when I meet really good ones, they're always asking me, you know, they pepper you with questions and you pepper them with questions and try to, you know, extract as much mutual information as possible. Um, they've got to be pretty understanding about people, people dynamics which is really hard. I think a lot of engineering-based CEOs are really comfortable with code and hard systems and things like that. And then as soon as you get to 
softer systems and organisms and people and teams, it uh, becomes really complicated. But that's, I mean, that's really where the success juice is, is right, getting a, a team to, to fire properly. Um, and we sort of blabbed our way through the first five years, but we didn't understand that, I think, and we've learned a lot about it since then. Mate, see here where I say question, Mike, what makes a great CEO? You say a great team, and then I cue the slide. Oh, sorry, should I have said that up front? Great team, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's do that again. No. <laughs> And so you've got to dress them Because like you really that. do have a phenomenal team. I mean, what's unique about this team other than their fashion sense? Um, uh, well, I mean, the culture of the company is awesome, right? Um, we try to hire people who want to run through walls, but at the same time, um, you know, want to help everybody around and run through walls. It's, it's a hard thing. There's certain companies that just have a cultural DNA that works for some reason. Um, and we, you know, we notice that even in our company, different companies in the past valley eras that we've hired from that have you know either long since disappeared or, or whatever um i actually interviewed a guy yesterday who worked at uh, bea systems which is again long gone um and uh, i asked him i'm like what is it you know we you're the 10th person we've we've sort of tried to hire from bea those sort of early early days first 100 200 employees what did they do to hire so many awesome people back then and he was like oh it's a good question umming and ahhing and um peoplesoft's another one we've done really well from something about certain companies the first Two, three hundred people start out on really the right vector, and then they just build on top of that, and it creates a great company culture. We've just tried to replicate that where possible. Get rid of the bad apples, screen culture first, and let the rest take care of itself. It, it's totally the DNA, for sure. Um, now, y you, w when I first met you, you had a, a great aversion to recruiters, um, as many entrepreneurs do. We do. Um, and I think I might have said, you know, as you grow, you're going to have to get, you may even have to get in-house recruiters, um, maybe to fix that. But is that what you've done? Or We, we have, I mean, we, we don't have an aversion to in-house recruiters. We have a little aversion to outhouse recruiters. Right. Um, some of my good friends are recruiters. Because so they belong in the outhouse, recruits. right? Um, <laughs> what's that? They belong in the outhouse, yeah. Uh, no, there's good recruiters and bad recruiters. I think the recruiting industry just gets, uh, unfortunately, that the bad apples outweigh the good apples significantly. Um, it's, the problem with recruiting is it's a sales job. Right, and outhouse salespeople that have no connection to the company are literally just looking to make a sale and move on. And you know, you've all been sitting at your desk when the phone rings. My phone rings, you know, um, a couple of times a day. Luckily, my PA picks it up now, but it's always someone who's trying to recruit me for some random job. And you're like, mate, have you done any research whatsoever? Like, I'm not <laughs> going to take an engineering job at Google. Like, it's just not. It's not. It's you not might. really going to be my next move, probably. You, you, uh, might, you might have what it takes to be a Google fiber engineer, though. I got. I got. Re I, I, I got rejected. Uh, actually, <laughs> so I um, I did funny story. I got emails from one of their auto email things. So I replied and said I'm interested, and then sent in my resume and then got rejected. So it was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> shit, felt a bit bad. Um, now we do have we do have a few in house recruiters now. Um, I mean, hiring at the pace we need to hire now is is one of our biggest challenges, and maintaining the cultural barrier and all that sort of thing. So um, we certainly have in house recruiters, but we we still haven't had a lot of success with out house recruiters at all. So um, you, basically, a few times. you basically made the recruiters part of the DNA by bringing them in? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, our, our recruiters get, um, get comped on, on the people they hire, but also on how long those people stick around and all that sort of thing and, and whether they hire the right people. Um, and, you know, their job, in effect, is to reduce the burden on the organisation of hiring. So if they, you know, bring in five people that get rejected, then everyone stops the, 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 the assembly line and says, OK, what was wrong with those five people? Were they the wrong culture fit, with the wrong skill fit, et cetera, so the recruiter can go back and get more, um, uh, you know, um, uh, better, better people in next time or, or better people to fit the role. Um, and that's sort of the contract between, um, between talent and the, the organisation at the moment. You and Scott used to interview everyone before they got an offer, right? Do you still you do that? or no, no, not anymore. Too much scale? Um, we, we, we definitely, at least one of us certainly interviews anybody uh, relatively senior, mm -hmm. um, anyone in the top probably 50 to 100 positions certainly gets interviewed by us, anyone new. Um, but no, we don't go too much beyond there anymore. It's too... Too hard? Too hard. I spend all my life recruiting anyway. I would just <laughs> spend the rest of my life doing recruiting as well. So, mate, um, at the time when you were first sort of starting to scale, between you guys, Google, and was it Silverbrook, the other company uh, yeah a little bit mystery one but you, you guys were sucking up just about every you know software guy in Sydney 
So how did you stand out from Google, which was big and well known? Uh, we didn't try to actually. We, we, um, I remember legendarily the, um, I don't know if anyone remembers, but when Salesforce started, they had this big no software campaign where they actually had placards with the big kind of no smoking sign with software written on it and they'd go and placard the uh, Oracle conferences and just wander around and try to create a, a, a nuisance to themselves. Um, and so we always thought that was really funny because the best way to, you know, pick a fight with somebody really big and then try to put yourself, you know, as close as possible to being on parity. Um, so that's exactly what we did with Google in Sydney. We, we basically tried to get across the message to the whole world that there was two places to work in Sydney. It was Alassian and Google. And if you wanted to work for the big company, you could do that. And it was kind of like that was the whole pitch. Um, and it actually worked remarkably well, um, probably better than we anticipated in our weird theoretical world of that's how to put ourselves into that, um, uh, that position. And then... Yeah, just try to provide a better job experience and a better hiring experience than Google. They, they, you know, they're notorious for taking months and months and months to make a decision on somebody, tens of interviews, et cetera, and we tend to say, look, we'll make a decision within a week. Um, we still put you through a lot of interviews, but we'll, you know, we'll be able to get it through quickly and make a yes or no call really clearly and concisely. And we've actually stolen a number of people who've been interviewing at both and have had an offer from us, and you know, it's still rolling along inside the Google process. Um, and you know, we kind of, they said yes before, before Google got a chance to make an offer. Um, it wasn't a sophisticated strategy. I mean, Sydney doesn't have many, many high-tech companies and now everyone's trying to do the same thing to us. So it's, uh, it's our challenge to kind of defend from all the little tykes that are doing exactly the same thing. One of the other things that you did that was really different, um, you, got, you and Scott spent a fortune <coughs> on lawyers trying to figure out how to give stock options to your team. We did. And I remember at the time that was very, very painful to go through. It still is. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of disadvantages there. We're trying to give out options in multiple geographies from an Australian corporation getting past all of Julie Gillard's rules. And uh, it has not, not been a particularly easy thing. I mean, I think we've got a workable program now. And again, the difficulty is you want them to be as equitable as possible, right? We're giving out US options that have a certain sort of tax you know, relevance and tax value and then Australian options and you don't want Australian employees, you know, should some event happen in the future, suddenly the Australian employees are like, hang on a sec, how come the US guy's got twice as much money and it all gets really complicated. Um, so we, we did spend an absolute fortune on, on lawyers to make that work. We'd love to contribute that to the company, to, to, to the world, to be honest, but it's, it's, it's so specific to what we do and the geos we operate in. Um, the Dutch employees are a whole different, different picture there. There's, totally different amount of red tape in that, that part of the world. So sure. um, it, it, it works now, but it's, it's far more painful than it needed to be, absolutely. And even for small, purely Australian startups, they have, they have a horrible problem getting across that. Um, because of the ATO? Because of the ATO, because of the way in Australia we tax options, um, which is it's insane. Um, and because of all the 50 employee rules and all sorts of different rules and regulations that they, they have, to, have to get past, people do all sorts of crazy contortions to get past the rules. It's, 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 it's nuts. But you believed um, strongly that um, employee ownership was important for building a great company. Yeah, um, we did. We really did. Um, it was interesting. We, we, I mean, we didn't give out options till 2010, right? Um, so... We were eight years in. You didn't have enough money for lawyers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have enough money to pay the lawyers. Um, I mean, we, we were very big on, on cash bonuses and other things uh, uh, before that. And um, we tried to make sure that people were, were well paid and had you know, an upside in terms of the, the success of the company. Um, a little bit the reflection of the bootstrapping roots because that was, that was what we had. Um, but uh, we'd always believed it was important. And when we gave them out in 2010, we we had an extra challenge and we tried to um, judge people's longevity with the company and effectively give them back conceptually all of the value that they would have missed from getting options two years ago, three years ago, et cetera. So the option curves got crazy complicated. Uh, I think we did an okay job. We got it sort of 80, 90% correct. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think it is important and we did a big uh, promotion campaign at the time. Uh, you'll see occasionally Alassians wandering around with the, the owner t-shirt and we got stylized versions of each of our office buildings done up and you know everyone's kind of an owner everyone got a big key on their desk and we sent something home to the partners all that sort of stuff yeah the t-shirts are famous actually and uh i couldn't find my <laughs> you got a lot of magic tricks going on today i couldn't find my no no bs t-shirt but i got this one um ah, I classic, like this one. Yep, sorry it's a yep. bit dirty but you know you know whenever any you wear this t-shirt it's actually got customer commentary on the back oh i love yeah i did i love those t-shirts awesome products yeah <laughs> 
So that's actually a customer gave us that slogan. So that's we're right. Very cheap on marketing. We um, we asked everybody what they wanted to put on a t-shirt, and if you picked the correct slogan, we'd uh, we'd send your team a bunch of t-shirts, and so that was a good one because you got issues. So we put that, sent them ten t-shirts. They loved it. So, so mate, you mentioned um, uh, Amsterdam, um, and you've also got people in Brazil. Um, so let's go to going global. Um, nice. And obviously, this was the moment you went global with that. What did Scott do to his hair? Uh, he, he got a mohawk for charity. Nice. Uh, if we, we did uh, Movember, uh, as we do every, every couple of years, and uh, if the company raised, I think it was, I can't remember what the lines were. It was like if we raised 20 grand, he was going to shave his head. If we raised 40 grand, he was going to get a mohawk and he'd keep it for a month and something, something, something. And it was like, anyway, he, that's why it ended up getting dyed blue and the whole bit. And there was a big... Uh, out in sort of auditorium like this, where he got it shaved off and all that sort of thing. So, so um, in the in the eighties and nineties, um, a lot of Australian companies tried to go global, um, just keep their headquarters in Australia R and D, but but really, you know, reach out into the US um, in particular. And in that in that era, um, it was really really hard because there's no internet. Mm -hmm. um, has the internet fundamentally reshuffled the deck so that you can build a great global company in Australia or from Australia? Um, I think it has for a lot of different industries. It depends on what your company is trying to do. Obviously, the more localised it is, the more you need in-person help, etc., uh, the, the, that, that's, that's still hard. We're still on the wrong end of the, of the planet. Um, we still have a lot of travel barriers, etc. Um, but for a lot of companies, if you are more virtual if you like, if you don't necessarily need to be where your customer is to, to shake their hand, then absolutely we have a good position. Um, and uh, you know, if you're targeting Asia, for example, obviously we've got a time zone advantage over the US um, and a flight advantage, You know, one flight to pretty much anywhere in Asia. So uh, I think the internet has certainly changed how you can distribute products if they're of a virtual nature from Australia to, to the rest of the world. And you certainly seem to have succeeded in, in doing that. Mate, when when US companies expand to Europe or China from here, um, they often do it too early and they make a lot of mistakes because they don't understand the cultural differences. How was how did you find it expanding from Australia? Um, yeah, we haven't. I don't, I don't know. If we've run into too many cultural difficulties. We still have a lot of problems in Japan. We're on um, V3 of the Japanese Atlassian office. We now have a full KK and everything, and have hired a a very senior guy over there who's um, who's driving Japan. It's it's like one percent of sales and should be should be a lot higher. Um, so you know countries like Japan, which are very culturally specific, it, it is more challenging. Um, we've done quite well in in Germany and and um, Western Europe just historically. Um, the only you know cultural sensitivity for there is that you know the privacy levels and different things in the software particularly is quite different. But we haven't had a lot of cultural barriers to deal with in our industry or in our particular sector. We haven't sort of really run into too much like that. If anything, we've transmogrified a little of the Australian culture into some of those companies and they tend to quite like it. They think it's kind of a little cool, a little random that they use software from Australia. We're still seeing in a lot of parts of the world as like Croc Dundee and Airs Rock and all that sort of thing. Um, so you can use that to an, as an advantage, as a differentiator? Yeah, I, I think the product has to be equally good as the you know sure. as the global com competition. But they they certainly there's some little random sprinkling of pixie dust that they they kind of like using an Australian uh, uh, product. You can't beat magic take dust. Take advantage of it. That's right. Yeah. Actually, speaking of magic dust, the the other thing, could you just could you just hold this for a second? Sure. Just hold it up because I got to get this right. There we go. <laughs> so <laughs> I told so him that photo was a bad idea. So you guys are you're, you guys are expanding um, to the world. So you're 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 well armed and well experienced. We are well armed, and ready well to go, ready to go global. We've no shortage of uh, of foam weaponry. I'm sure, um, mate. When you did that expansion, you, you you had sort of competitors. You guys were a little bit in blue ocean, but but you did have competitors peripherally. How did they react? Um. Yeah, we're like, the, we're like the sleeping giant when it comes to our competitors. Most of them don't know who we are until it's too late, um, which is sometimes the best position to be in, really. I mean, uh, you know, we have... Yeah, I wouldn't say we have no competitors. We have, we have, the problem is we have too many competitors to worry about any given one at the moment. Um, and it's pretty much been our life all the way through. Obviously, as the company has gotten more complex uh, and, and, and broader in its product set, 
each product has a series of specific competitors. Um, we, the big guys didn't know who we were for many, many, many years. They, they now do, I think, and they, they care a little bit. Um, it's a big joke with my dad, who you know was on that early photo. He used to work for IBM, and uh, IBM is one of our big competitors, and he'd always find it a little amusing. Um, he was in one part of the beast, and you know our competitors in another part of the beast, so they never sort of hit each other. Occasionally, someone would email him and say, "Is your relationship to this company?" And he'd be like, "No, nope, nothing to do with me." <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, we you know we now know that they have a you know they have like a forty five page deck on how to destroy one of our products and all this sort of stuff. So you know that's sort of a um, for their sales team, it's it's a little compliment, I suppose. Um, but other than that, no, I mean we we you know we just take the competitors as one on one all the time. And not worry too much about them and focus on your customers and your products. Yeah, definitely don't worry too much about them and focus on the customer. You can't, you can't ignore them completely. You can't just pretend they don't exist and stick your head in, a, in, in the sand, I think, as some people will tell you to do. Um, you have to absolutely focus on the customer, but at the same time, you have to know what they're up to and where they're likely to go. I guess you sort of plan the chess move, and if they're going that way, you know, do we want to go that way and hit them head on, or do we want to sort of try and go around them, or what's, what's the play there? And it gets more complicated as you're... You know, product strategy evolves and the number of products you have evolves, et cetera, because our, our competitors are constantly shifting. And the irony is, we were just talking about this yesterday, we've been around long enough now that we've seen sort of whole generations of companies come and go and disappear. And once you get to that point, you start to realize the competitors, you, you stop sort of fearing them so much. We've seen competitors who suddenly got tons of funding and they were going to put us out of business and all this, that and the other, or certainly in one product set. And then, you know, they dribble along and dribble along and finally get bored in some sort of valley fire sale for some you know, amount and they disappear off into some behemoth company never to be seen again and you, know, you suddenly realise that you've survived more than, than you know, a whole lot of these companies. And You're sounding like the old man in your industry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty old for tech now. So mate, you, you know I, I love to have theories about strategy for, for companies um, and especially Atlassian. Um, so my theory was that you and Scott had this wonderful vision um, of a new way to collaborate, um, like outside of the sort of crusty old email space. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you, you created Confluence, um, which a lot of aspects of which have this amazing collaborative, communicative um, thing to them. Um, but you also solved a fundamental problem that you and Scott were basically your own customers in how to code and how to fix problems in code and how to manage teams spread out around the world. Um, but it looks to me, because you didn't take venture money until very, very late in the game. It wasn't really venture, it was private yeah, equity. I always give the Excel guys crap. You look at 2010, it wasn't a particularly good year, you see. We said didn't, didn't grow very much. That was when we took money. I think it was the VCs put us on the wrong path for about a year there. Yeah, that's what I was gonna, that was my point. Yeah, obviously it was the VCs <laughs> fault, obviously. Um, and yet... No, it was the GFC. And hit, yet hit the you... you um, it, it seemed to me that you, you kind of had the ability to trade time for money. Um, because you were, you were swimming in the blue ocean, you had a vision that was a bit different to everybody else, you didn't really have direct competitors, and so you could afford to take your time, grow organically, really carve out a niche for yourself. So you didn't yeah, need to a little bit, a little bit. Um, I mean, we've worked hard on it. Uh, we have a longer term model, it's more like a SaaS model, so that takes time for those models to get rolling and the you know, recurring revenue to, to start coming through, et cetera. Um, I think there's a certain, we were just talking about this at the bar yesterday. There's a great presentation from the Constant Contact founder. I don't You're know not going to mention anything else from the bar yesterday, are you? We were, th we were there pretty late. I'm not no, sure. No, 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 let's not It's Australian, it. right? That's, That's not supposed to be. Let's not go there. We're all there talking about this tech. That's filmed. how nerdy yeah. we are. Um, uh, it, there's a great presentation from the CEO of a company called Constant Contact uh, called The Long Slow March of Death or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Long Slow Valley of Death, something like this. And... Uh, they basically have a curve that looks exactly like ours. And if you think, it, it, there's, there's a certain generation of tech companies that never get written about. The um, uh, LinkedIn's, Odesk, you know, Constant Contact. There's a lot of these examples where they spent five or six years really sputtering around below the radar, just kind of growing a base. And then by the time they you know, get big enough for everyone to start cheering, it's, you know, it's almost an inevitability by that point, right? So we did have the advantage of spending five or six years largely in Australia with very little media coverage, very little you know, competitive courage, just you know, slowly gaining customers and gaining organisational learning that I think we've you know, benefited from in the last five years. And we didn't have any investor pressure to say, 
you know, we've got to get big, we've got to grow, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, like now, 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 now. Um, I don't honestly know how the story would have been different had we had, we had that. I'm sure we would have had a lot more pressure there. Um, but, you know, we've, what's hard is you can't, you, you scale that chart up. Uh, you know, even in those early years, the, the growth rate was pretty high. Sure. Um, and so you were always, almost always profitable, right? We have always been profitable, right. yeah. Which is uh, sorry, my CFO unique. would tell me sorry that I should say that we've had forty straight quarters <laughs> of positive cash flow. Is Mate, how he would he would phrase that? You're rehearsing your roadshow speech. I, I'm I'm always getting slapped by the CFO for saying the wrong thing. So you're not going to tell us when you're following the S1 then? No, absolutely oh, not. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So on IPOs, <clears throat> the, the the nearest thing I could find <clears throat> to Atlassian to compare it to was Jive, and sorry the slides are a little bit off, um, but. Jive did take venture money um, and it went public um, in, at the end of uh, 2011. Um, but it's interesting, uh, they're nowhere near as profitable as you. Um, yeah. They don't really have as much revenue. Well, te- I mean, let's correct that, they're not profitable. Right, there you go. Right. <laughs> um, Vastly un- unprofitable, in fact. And they, they sort of meandered around for about five years, then Sequoia noticed them, put money in, um, kind of started to drive revenue, drive value, um, really kind of pump the company. I know Kleiner paid up massively to get into Jive mm-hmm. because they felt like they were missing the this this sort of sea change of, of collaboration, online collaboration. To be fair, they missed everything for about a four-year period there. Well, yeah, but a lot of people missed this. I mean, you guys yeah, really yeah. were in a blue ocean. So Kleiner paid up big time to get in um, at a sim- similar price, actually, to what Axel <laughs> paid for you, mm-hmm. um, but you were profitable and well, I can't say how much revenue you had, but you had a lot. Um, and yet... You guys, knowing the numbers, you're more profitable, more revenue, um, easily IPOable, without mm-hmm. any venture sure. really at all, and much more predictable too. I mean, don't forget we, it's I mean the, 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 it's it's a hard comparison because they have a radically different model. Right, they have a much more traditional, heavy sales based enterprise software, you know, million dollar sales kind of uh, model than we do. We, thousand dollars at a time, you know, uh, uh, tens of thousands of customers. So our, our predictability is kind of. Um, very, very different. We have a, a linear slope, which means we're never going to blow out a quarter in an upwards direction, but at the same time, we're not going to have that panicked last week where, where the whole thing may go south. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because we know the Jive guys really well, right? The two, two founders. You slept on the same couches pretty too. Pretty good right? mates. We've slept on the same couches <laughs> and, uh, you know, we kind of grew up together uh, as companies. So, look, they, they took a different path to, to what we did and ostensibly they were... I think further behind in sort of 06, 07, you know, we, we, were, we were miles ahead revenue wise, um, but with a very different model. And they switched from effectively our model to, you know, a more traditional enterprise sales model when, when Sequoia came on board. Um, and I, I think, you know, for their business, that was probably the right move. I think that the, the classical mistake in any tech or maybe in anything is to, to, to go take someone's business or story and sort of carbon copy the, the ideas into, into your story. And, you know, they're a good example where they've done all the right moves for them that's mm-hmm. made a, a great business on that side and we've done all the right moves for us. In their market space, I'm not sure our model would have worked so well or maybe it would have taken longer to, to work. Um, but look, they're a good good company. I think they'll, they'll do very well. Sure, sure. So now you're on everybody's radar, well and truly. Um, <laughs> One of the things that... That's um, pretty recent. That's from like three or four weeks ago. Yeah. Um, one, of the thing, <laughs> one, of, one of the things that um, amazes me is how this little guy taught you to read and how that inspired you. Because one of the first charities Atlassian gave money to was this Learn to Read Room charity. To read, Room sure. to Read. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about that? Uh, uh, about Room to Read? Yeah. And yeah, why, Room to Read is a and great charity. Is why you did it? Why you oh, did why it we so did it? Sure. Um, I mean, we've, we've had the Atlassian Foundation for a, a long time now and... Um, had a very early meeting uh, with Salesforce and uh, sort of understanding how they connected their, their charitable aspects to, to Salesforce in the early days. And um, Mark was very prescient in how he did that. So we, look, let's face it, we copied a lot of his aspects um, because he'd done a lot of things right. Um, so we set up the Elastin Foundation very early in the piece. So it has uh, 1% of equity in the company, uh, which will hopefully be worth something at, at some time in the future. Um, it has uh, uh, 1% of uh, employee times, so that's the five, five days a, a, a year, and then it gets 1% of, um, of, of profits going into it in, in funds that it can distribute to uh, employee-related causes, et cetera. Um, and one of the reasons to set that up is we'd always 
done donations from the company in the early days, but it was very much the Mike and Scott show. And, you know, both our mums had breast cancer, so we'd put money into breast cancer. Like, it was just a bit random, found and directed, and we wanted it to be something that kind of outlasted us in a way, in that, you know, employees should drive the, the collective um, direction of the, the philanthropic efforts. Um, so we set that all up, and then we ran into Room to Read uh, as a charity. I read John's book, for anyone who hasn't, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, his first book now, technically. Um, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, which... Uh, is a fascinating book. Thoroughly encourage anyone to read it. It's ironic that we're in the Microsoft campus today because uh, he used to work for Microsoft, an executive actually down in Sydney, and he went on holiday to the Himalayas uh, because it was, quote, the only place that he couldn't hear Steve Barmer screaming at him, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is why he went all the way up in the Himalayas. And then, you know, he started the charity and he, he, he you know, got into uh, providing libraries to schools. And we, we loved it, so we said, oh, we want to run a campaign for you. I remember we emailed them, uh, this is back in 2007, and said, look, we want to run a campaign. We've got a product that we want to give away for a week, and we're going to charge five bucks for it, and we want to give you all the proceeds. And they, I think we got a polite email that said, great, you know, thanks very much. Um, and uh, they tweeted about it or something, uh, uh, and, you know, that was about it. And then we smashed week one, and we, our goal was $25,000, so 5,000 copies, and we sold 125000 dollars worth of stuff so we gave him a check for 125,000 and then John rings me he's kind of confused he's like so what do you guys do <laughs> <laughs> you know um, and uh, that program is still going we've made it full-time etc so if you buy any Atlassian product or uh, it's not technically true nowadays but almost any Atlassian product for the small team so 10 user tier uh, we instead of giving it away we charge ten dollars and we give it all to room to read and we've um, yeah we're now their biggest corporate Donor worldwide, and it's it's kind of a bit nuts. I think it's us, you know, Barclays, Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, or something like <laughs> it's a silly looking league table. Um, but uh, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal charity. So, uh, so I really encourage you to check it out. And very valley driven, actually, for, for the, the valley folk in the audience. It, it basically started up here, it's run like a tech company, high growth, high ROI, you know, really accountability. Um, got a lot of early funding from. Uh, uh, one of the old school VCs um, whose name escapes me right now uh, made a lot of money, did a lot of philanthropy and gave sure. them their first so couple hundred grand and yeah. uh, to, to kind of get started as a charity and now they're just they're rocking it. So Right, right. And, and it's not the only thing that you do, right? Because I've, I've been at Atlassian where you had code camp set up where you bring in all these young kids, some students or whatever, spend the weekend learning how to code. You you go around, you and Scott go around to NICTA and high schools and universities and kind of encourage kids to get more engaged and think more entrepreneurially. You do a lot of that sort of give back work. Uh, yeah, yeah, we certainly, we're a little bit the suckers for talking at universities and, um, and schools. Uh, I, I just believe that you, you make a lot more impact at that level. You know, if you get to kids early, um, then you can, you can make a lot more impact on, on their future direction. So we certainly do that and we're heavily biased towards computer science and the technical pursuits. Um, and certainly Australia doesn't generate anywhere near enough uh, of those as we need. Um, recent visa scandals, et cetera, aside. But um, uh, an interesting stat, so we, um, I think we graduate 4,000 computer science students a year uh, in Australia, uh, and we have had, at the moment, somewhere north of 600 grad applications for Atlassian. So if we're sucking up more than 10% of the grad supply in applications, all computer science graduates an entire year, we're just not graduating anywhere near enough. If you think of all the other startups, all the big technology companies, all the big, you know, retail manufacturing, Telstra, et cetera, we need far, far, far more technical graduates than we have at the moment in the country. Right. But not many hardware guys, right? Too many hardware guys. Uh, we have a lot of hardware guys in Australia. We're, just, we're good at that. We have history of that. Sorry, I'm... Uh, there we go. Now, mate, then disaster strikes, awesome. right? You're totally on the radar now, okay? So you and I were having lunch when you got the phone call the day before this went live from BRW, and this is the expression on your face when you heard it. Yeah, and fine. you actually said, oh, something else, but I changed it, right? <laughs> you weren't happy about this. No, it's, there's nothing good that comes from that. <laughs> well, mate, now Everyone that you're firmly on the radar, weirdly and I think the competition's going to be all over you, so I think you need another prop. Um, let me get this out of here. I think you need a bigger gun. <laughs> You're going to need more. 
don't know if you know how to put that together, but I think you need more. Absolutely don't. What, is this a silencer for a foam gun? Is that yeah, what that is? Click, clicks, on the, clicks on the end. Just yeah. in case someone doesn't see so you coming? you can coming? continue to be stealthy. Awesome. Um, mate, the, the message in that too is, is uh, um, rifle shot or focus, putting all the energy behind, all the wood behind the arrowhead, right? You've got mm -hmm. to be incredibly focused now because people are, you are on everyone's radar now. Um, sure. And sure. the moves you make in the next couple of years, presuming you take the company public, you know, you've got some, I'm assuming you're a year you away. You just file an on pressure here, is that what you're, what you're totally, doing? Totally, yeah, <laughs> totally. I'm trying. Is there yeah, a question yeah. at the end of that? Yeah, so. Um, uh, look, I Will guess so. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're I don't think we're going to do anything other than what we've done in the past, right? We, we kind of do our own thing, so. Um, yeah, look, I don't, I don't know. That just. Those magazines are total BS, right? They just calculate their own numbers and right, there's so no basis I, I to it. I know you want me to get that off the screen, so yeah. I will. Yeah. Mate, what I fear is that what's next for you is this, and I found this T-shirt in your bag as well. You had another T-shirt, and every time you get a T-shirt, I get worried. So, mate, <laughs> you're not going to you're not going to become a VC and deprive the world of another company, surely not? No, I I, I like to support them and and donate money to them, as my wife would say. Um, <laughs> They're a charitable cause. They need uh, <laughs> need some help. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, d I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that's my uh, uh, career direction. I'm interested in it. I, I do a lot of investing, etc. But I don't think turning up to weekly partner meetings and all that sort of stuff is is uh, not for you. Is my gig. Thank um, God, mate. Um, tell the audience because you do do a lot of investing, both through Blackbird and also personally yep. directly. Um, tell the audience what you're looking for. Um, uh, it's it's a hard one, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're looking for companies that you think can, can succeed. Um, I think you're looking for people who are very passionate about what they do. Uh, I mean, one of my biggest bugbears is people go, oh, I think there's a great opportunity here, there's a great this, there's a great that. And I, a couple of times recently, and I do a lot of the, I'm a the venture partner at Blackbird, which is kind of all title, um, and basically means I, I screen deals for them and help them, you know, meet teams and and and, uh, and give my piece on what I think of the team. And I, I've met a couple recently, and they go through the pitch and blah blah. And I say, slow down a second, just zoom out. Strack, what do you want to do? Like, what what do you? I want to know what they're passionate about. And if they say, well, I think there's a great business opportunity. You know, we can all make a lot of money effectively. I'm like, look, that's 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 not not really there, right? If they are extremely passionate about the particular area of technology or they see there's a big flaw or a pain and they're going to fix things, uh, you know, that's, that's the biggest mistake that, that people make, I think. And with entrepreneurialism becoming so uh, sensationalised in the media, etc., there's a lot of people who get into it just because they think they can make money and they're not passionate about solving problems at all. Um, so I certainly look for that. Smart teams. Amen. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, technical teams. I... I tend to sway towards the more technical guys that can really go deep on, on what they're doing. Um, uh, it's hard, not necessarily experience because you don't find it in Australia, but a belief in people that c can solve the problems that are in front of them. One of the benefits of having seen three, three startmate years go through now is you start to get pattern recognition of the guys and you're like, I reckon those guys are going to make it. I don't really understand the business and I don't really know what they do and I don't think they understand it either, but... There's something in that team. It's just this this aggressive DNA to say, not in a in a in a in a, in a negative aggressive way, but like we're going to make this work. I'm going to get through all the brick walls that are in front of me, even though I don't know what they are yet. And you just know that they're talented enough, and they seem to learn fast enough that they're gonna they're gonna figure out how to make it work. Uh, I don't know what that magic X factor is, but there's something in that. Sure. Well, if you've if you've had it yourself, then you recognise it in others. I think. Yeah, mate, I don't know. I don't, would we have recognised it in ourselves 10 years ago? I don't well, know. no one did, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't think we would have given ourselves any money, so... Mate, one of the problems um, with being you um, is uh, people want you to dispense wisdom and advice. Um, and I remember the first time you and I had lunch, um, uh, you gave me three classic pieces of Mike's wisdom, and the danger of that is it gets quoted back to you, and I'm going to do that now. So your first piece of wisdom was... No one over 30 should start a company. Right. Your second piece of wisdom was software is eating the world. And your third piece of wisdom is, um, Larry, why do you waste your time on hardware? 
<laughs> Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> Still pretty accurate. <laughs> well, I, I find it interesting because I'm obviously I'm a hardware guy, but your best project in your life was this little piece of hardware right here. It's software, mate. It's not hardware. <laughs> well, it's all up here. I think the software is still developing, right? The software is, yeah, it's been hardware is looking moment, pretty good. He's, he's figuring it out, so. And the software is always late, right? How do you find these Hardware's random photos? Dumb. This is the top of uh, Cigaria in Sri Lanka, actually. I, I, <laughs> I heard it was a long climb with him on your shoulders. It was an extremely long climb. Yeah. Uh, so, mate, why don't you give some advice to the entrepreneurs in the audience here who are, you know, at the start of their entrepreneurial journey? Uh, some of them may be over 30. So. I still like that, that pitch. I mean, no, look, over 30, I, I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's much harder, right? If, if, if we had to start again today, um, you know, with the, the little bloke and I got another one on the way and, and, and the wife and, and the mortgage and all that sort of thing, it's just, it's just the odds are stacked against you much more. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same thing with, with fundraising and I think your advice about uh, Red Hot coming here, et cetera, is the same. It's like people turn up here and assume that there's much more money and they're absolutely accurate in their assumption that there's much more money here. They're inaccurate in the fact that the competition is less. You know, if there's, you know, five rounds a year in Australia that are of a decent size and a hundred companies vying for them and there's 5,000 rounds here, there's hundreds of thousands of companies vying for those rounds. So I'm not sure your odds of success are any better over here. Um, uh, I just think if you, you, yeah, I mean, if you're over 30 and you've got, you know, the dependencies of, the, of life, it just, it's just harder, you've just got more stacked against you. It doesn't mean you can't succeed, it's just, it's just more difficult. Um, I still agree with those other advice. I think software is, is it. it. For the next 10 years or until we come up with something better, it, everything is software nowadays. It's, hardware is, uh, it's, 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 it's important and it, it will be a big industry, but software is what is truly transforming everything. And um, we can have esoteric debates, but most hardware is just software nowadays. It's, uh, generic chips, so stick stick with that um, and go solve a real problem. It's, it's uh, funny. Um, when, you <coughs> when you know what you're doing, you do it in hardware. Um, and when you don't, you do it in software because you can change your mind. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Mike. It's pretty fair. Thank you oh, for cheers. this. Wow. Um, I know your wife um, probably can't drink at the moment, but um, please crack it when... To celebrate the new I baby. will I will do and from all of us we're, you're a great role model um, you're providing great leadership for the entrepreneurial community and you've proven that you can build a great global company in Australia so you can we have as many more so thank you thanks man That's very nice I think we have time for like one or two questions and then sorry we used up all the time we have to get off for the next act and I'll take the nerf guns mate so that I don't think sure yeah you might need these please Use them, there's a pitch session tomorrow, isn't there? You can... Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> any, any questions in the audience? Far away, fellas. Up the back there. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. <laughs> no, it's bullshit. <laughs> um, but think, think about why you move, don't, I, I mean, maybe the, the best piece of advice to take from that is if anyone gives you advice and you follow it blindly and you don't understand it, then you're a mug and y you're probably going to get it wrong along the way because you didn't really understand, um, you know, what they were saying. There's, there's certainly a lot of opportunity up here. There's a fantastic ecosystem, don't get me wrong. I, I love, I mean, I'm here like one week in four, right? And it's, it's an awesome place. Creativity, the passion of people, the, the spirit is just amazing. You go to the bar. Everyone's talking tech 24-7. It's just like, you know, you go home and it's, it's totally different, right? Um, your ability to start companies in Australia, I think, is actually pretty good. You can source talent. Trust me, we're trying to hire up here. It's brutal. It's beyond brutal. It's just, you know, you want to find an iOS engineer and they're like, oh, I want 200 grand a year plus options plus this and that. And you're like, holy crap, you're 21. <laughs> right? You read how to code <laughs> iOS apps in a week and you're talented, but fuck. Um, and then they turn you down and go work somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's really hard up here. It's very, very hard. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity, but there's a lot of difficulty that people don't see that are advantages you have down there. Now, I would encourage you to take as much of the DNA as possible from up here. And I think any Australian entrepreneur that hasn't been here is making a mistake too, right? So there's sort of a balancing act there. And you should spend as much time up here to absorb all of those things, but then I think building your business is easier in Australia, I would say, personally, than building it up here. Um, 
as it gets bigger in scale, certainly the scale capital is, is absolutely up here. So there's different points in the journey where different things make sense. Um, uh, it's not easy. I mean, we have about a quarter of our staff up here, so I can't claim to, to not not have taken advantage of a lot of the, uh, the the good things that are here. But it's it's not a simple answer, I would say, as, as yet yeah, you should move. Um, and uh, I mean, Nikki, Nikki was saying yesterday, it's interesting, if you look at the value of Australian tech companies created in Australia versus the value of Australian tech companies created by Australians moving their company over here, it's literally orders of magnitude greater the people that have stayed in Australia than the people that have succeeded up here. Probably two orders of magnitude, he reckons, greater if you add all the large technology companies in Australia that have been started in the last 10 years versus the ones that moved up here. And quite a few of them have been successful up here, et cetera. So I don't know if that's empirical evidence. We don't have enough data points, but... Oh, if Nicky said it, you can bet he analysed it. He's, yeah, he's good with <laughs> spreadsheets, so... <laughs> um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank no, you. Right. Let me thanks Mike again. Thanks. That's all right. Take this. Let's get off. <laughs>